Are you ready to worship? Yes. Amen. If you have your Bible, stand up and hold your Bible above your head and bear witness of God's word and show it to the person around you, the person in front of you, behind you. You're freely able to wave this Bible. You're freely able to bring that Bible. That's a praise in itself. You may be seated. There are three places I would like you to turn to today in reference to the sermon. There will be other places that you can write down, but don't let three places scare you. We'll try to move through this in a timely manner. I understand uh, the temperature out here. I know that God's going to see us through it. Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. The next place is Acts. The book of Acts chapter 27. And James chapter 1. Matthew 14. Acts 27. James chapter 1. Today I want to share with you two stories about two different believers who were in similar circumstances. One of the believers we know is a standard in the Bible. It was the Apostle Peter. He walked with Jesus. We know that Peter represented the leadership of the disciples. We know that he was a believer. And then we represent in the story in Acts, the Apostle Paul, who we know is a believer. I want to share with you the circumstances they were going through, but the different ways that they approached it in hopes that we can relate to that today. But what I want you to focus on is the amount of faith and the kind of faith that they used to get through the circumstance. So let me begin by talking about faith. We say that word faith a lot in church. The Apostle Paul defines faith as the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is a belief in something that you can't see. Faith is when you trust something without knowing the outcome for certain. It's taking what's told you and hiding it in your heart and believing it unto the point of putting your life into that belief. The faith that God talks about is not a faith that considers something to maybe be something you want to believe. The faith that he speaks about is a believing faith where you're all in. Is anybody here all in in your faith? You're not having faith in the circumstance, you're having faith in God to bring you through the circumstance. There is one thing that we need to make clear that really is not being spoken at a lot of gatherings and churches today. Some of the most, I guess you would say, successful churches in numbers aren't giving a message of the believing faith that you have to have. It's not just that there is a God in heaven and we are here and if we are good enough, then we can be together with God someday. It is not that if we believe there is a God, that we can come into fellowship with Him. It is not that if we believe that Jesus Christ historically came to this earth and died on a cross. That is not what allows us to be with God. And you say, hold on a second. Yes, you have to believe in God and you have to believe that Jesus is our is the sacrifice for our sin. Yes, you have to believe it, but you have to own that belief. You can't just believe it. You have to own that belief. In other words, you have to believe in God for your salvation and you have to believe in Jesus Christ for your way to God. I want to explain this in a way to share the gospel. This is the good news. And this is what's not being shared. You see, you can't just gather and speak about things that will make us feel good and things that will encourage us to keep us going on and saying we can come together and do our best and this will get us through. You can't preach a message unless you preach the cross of Jesus Christ. The cross of Jesus Christ is what allows us to come into fellowship with God. You have to preach the bloody cross. You have to preach that there was a sacrifice made on the cross because without the sacrifice of Jesus, this is the good news, we can't come to God. God is a holy and righteous God. And the Bible says that all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It says that there is none righteous, no, not one. So we're stopped. We're blocked from being able to have fellowship with God. Listen, this is the gospel. But God loves you. 
and God loves you so much, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Romans 5, 8. What did he do? He sent Jesus Christ to die for us. And the Bible tells you that you have a choice. It tells you that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. We can stay in our sinful state and hope that we'll get to God or try to work that we get to God. But the Bible also tells us that it's an act of grace that we're saved. What do you mean saved? Saved from the penalty of sin. What's the penalty of sin? Separation from God because I'm a sinner and he is not. Saved from eternal hell, which is the punishment for me never coming and accepting Jesus Christ. I can be saved from that. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that Jesus made an imperative statement that said, in your lifetime, you must be born again. Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. If you want to have fellowship with him, you can't hope. You can't say maybe. You can't say, I'll try to do good enough because the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith that not of yourself. It's a gift of God. You can't work for it. But if you choose to humble yourself to God and believe that there is one and only true living God and that he loves you and that he wants fellowship with you and you accept his gift, what is the gift? For God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him, not believes that he is, but believeth in him, puts your life in your belief, should not perish but have everlasting life. You see, we have to make a choice to do that. That's our initial faith. That's our initial belief. And if you have that initial belief, you are joined together with God. The Bible says that you're no longer separate from him. It says you're given the Holy Spirit. And you're not to live in a spirit of bondage again to fear, but you become the adopted child of God. Glory to God. We should be shouting the place down. If that happened to you, say amen. amen. That's that initial faith, that believing faith that you have to have. If you have faith in God and His promises, you can have assurance and confidence that he'll bring you through any circumstance. The problem we face is that we do face circumstances. And in the middle of those circumstances, we have this believing faith that we put over here that says, hey, I believe that God can get me through this situation. How many people believe that God can get you through the situation we're going through right now? And without a doubt, you raise your hand. You know, we're experiencing circumstances like we've never faced. COVID-19, social unrest, unprecedented violence, acceptance of anti-God movements, the endorsement of lawlessness and criminality. How many people have, have seen this in the past weeks and the past months and living with this and all of a sudden you go back into a state of fear or worry or anger? Or maybe you just get in a group and you all have the same view and so it becomes a group of grumbling. And we leave that group of gr grumbling not figuring out anything, not feeling better, but everybody has had their say. Oh, come on, let me get a witness. I've been in some of those groups. I walk up on those groups. And I've been a part of some of those groups. You see, when I ask you how many people believe that God can bring us through this circumstance and completely trust him trust him to bring us through it you raise your hand right how many people believe it you have that initial faith that initial belief so you you basically smother everything that's going on with this belief that says I believe he can get us through then why is it that we go back to those times of worry and times of fear and times of anger and times of grumbling I want to talk about today a faith that outlasts the circumstance a faith that outlasts the circumstance the first example I want to give you is a true believer his name was Peter you know a lot about Peter but we read about him in Matthew chapter 14 Jesus had just fed the 5,000 
What a great miracle. Five loaves, two fish, fed 5,000 plus. He left there. He went up on the mountain to pray. He sent his disciples over the Sea of Galilee and said, I'll meet you there. I'll meet you where we're going. During the night or the early morning, what the Bible calls the fourth watch, which is between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m., the disciples were experiencing a storm on the sea. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 14, verse 23, excuse me, verse 24, it says, But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. How many people know that Jesus was literally defying gravity, defying the elements, and walking on the sea? Do you believe that? That's part of your believing faith. It says that when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It's a spirit, and they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spoke unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be you, bid me come unto you on the water. And Jesus said, Come. When Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But, everybody say but out loud. This is a big but in chapter 14. There's some big buts in the Bible. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. Beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and called him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore did you doubt? When they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. I want you to notice what Jesus said in verse 27. It seems unthinkable. I want you to picture yourself in this boat with the disciples. Have you ever been on a, on a boat in a storm? You know, just a, a three-foot wave or three-foot sea is what they call it. Can take that boat and take it up and down, much less what it does to you inside. But it's the wind. It's the wind that makes the waves. And they were scared. And on top of that scaredness, then they saw, and the Bible says they all saw Jesus walking on the water and they thought he was a ghost. So there was a real fear. They were in a circumstance. When you're in a circumstance in a boat that's going up and down and back and forth and this side's way up and down, you begin to wonder if you're going to get through it. And Jesus made this statement, be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. How in the world could he say, be of good cheer? Why are you guys upset? Why are you fearful? Change your attitude. It is I. Imagine those words, it is I. Be not afraid. It's me, guys. Whatever happened to you whenever you were with me? Did I not take care of everything? It's I. That's what he's trying to say. He goes on in verse 28. Peter said, Lord, if it's you, let me come to you. And Jesus said one word, come. The power, the power of the, the words of Jesus, amen. Come, Peter. He saw Peter's initial faith. You can say all you want to about Peter because you know the rest of the story. You know that Peter began to sink, but it took faith to step out of that boat. Nobody else was stepping out of it. And Peter said, Lord, if it's you, bid me come to you. And he said, come. And Peter stepped out of the boat. And it says Peter began to walk on water also. Why? Because Jesus says come. And when Jesus says come, nothing can stop you from going from your point to him. Come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. He continually says, Come, there's a call to come. But it says, When Peter saw the wind boisterous, he looked around and he saw the waves, and he was walking on the water, but wave here, wave here, wind, and he began to think with logic, What am I doing? This doesn't look good, it's not going to turn out good. It said he began to sink. 
and Jesus reached down after Peter said, Lord, save me. It said, and I love this, look at the verse, immediately Jesus reached down and saved him. And he didn't say, hey, Peter, I, I've got you. He said, Peter, oh, you have little faith. Wherefore, why did you doubt? You were doing so good. Why'd you doubt? Didn't I say come? Didn't you, you know that I could get you from where you were to me and nothing would happen? Why? Why did you doubt? See, Peter began to sink because his faith didn't last. You see, he was in the circumstance, and it tells you the storm was going on until Jesus got back in the boat. Now get this, it's big. The storm kept lasting, but his faith didn't last. His faith didn't outlast his circumstance. You see, he had initial faith, like we do sometimes. But then when the circumstance lasts longer than we thought it would, how many of you thought we would still be going through what we started going through in March? Anybody? No, there are people that asked me my opinion. I was wrong. How many else out here were wrong? Anybody wrong? We didn't think it would last. But you see, it doesn't matter how long the circumstance lasts as if we know we're going to get through it. Now, I want to bring up something important here. Now, if you go back and look, we can't just make this about Peter because he told his disciples, hey, I want you to go, and I'm going to meet you over there. If he told them he was going to meet them, should they have feared that they weren't going to get there? That's a big deal. Now, Peter had a faith, but it was a, an initial faith. And that faith, that faith didn't outlast the circumstance. Next person I want to talk to you about, in contrast, was the Apostle Paul. I told you to turn to Acts 27, but I'll begin in Acts 23. You don't have to turn there, but if it's close, you, you can. I'll reference a couple of things because this story takes up several chapters. No, we're not going to read all the chapters, but go back and read them sometime. In Acts chapter 23, as Paul was preaching, a riot broke out. But the riot broke out with the religious people that were claiming all kind of good things. And as the riot broke out, the chief captain scooped up Paul because he was afraid he'd be torn to pieces. And he took him into custody. And as Paul was in custody, verse 11 of Acts 23, the Bible says that the Lord stood by him. That means that he said it happened at night. Could have been in a vision. We don't know exactly how it was, but the presence of God spoke to him so clearly stood by him, verse 11, Acts 23, and said, see if these words sound familiar to you, be of good cheer, Paul. It's important that Paul is in there. Do you know that the Lord speaks to us specifically? Be of good cheer, Paul. Why should I be of good cheer? I'm arrested. I'm somewhere. I can't even do what I need to do. And why am I here? And how in the world can you expect me to be happy about this? Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must you bear witness also at Rome. You say, why does that change things? Because Paul knew at that point, no matter what circumstance he would face, he was going to make it through it because the Lord had told him, promised him that he was going to go to Rome. Paul had faith that God was going to bring him through his circumstance. At that point, Paul knew, no matter what happened here where I am, I'm going to Rome. So I can't die here. If God already said, I'm going to meet you there, you get what I'm saying? Then nothing could happen to you to change your attitude. Oh, you can be tested 
but that testing would be proven because you would have faith more than just an initial believing faith you would have a faith that outlasts your circumstance amen you say how long does it last for Paul well, we're not going to go through all the scripture, but you might want to write this down. In Acts chapter 24, Paul was taken in front of Felix, and he was put on trial, and a trial that could have led to his execution, his death. He was in prison for two years, and then you go to chapter 25, so someone else was called in. His name was Festus. He stood trial before Festus. He was able to witness to Felix. He was able to witness to Festus and all those people were there. And then they called in the big guns. King Agrippa came. And when King Agrippa came, he bore witness to King Agrippa so much so that he said, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Was Paul speaking his word the whole time? Yes. Was Paul scared? It never will show you where Paul is scared. Why? He knew he was going to Rome. He lived with the promise of God that says, I'm going to, outlast your circumstance what's amazing is then he faced a true test it wasn't a man it was those elements again if you look at chapter 27 I encourage you to read chapter 27 they said Paul you are going to Rome we're going to put you on a ship he was on a ship with 276 other people prisoners sailors and that ship experienced the storm that ship experienced a circumstance. And if you read in Acts chapter 27, and you get down to verse 20, it will show you the desperation in all of the voices of those 276 people. It said they all felt like all their hope was gone. The storm was so bad, they threw all the things on the ship to lighten the ship. The pieces of the ship were breaking off the people were so sick, they didn't eat for two weeks. What kind of sick? Seasick. They were weakened physically. They were going through a circumstance that didn't look good. It said all hope is lost. And then Paul stands up in front of them. In verse 22, there's something different about Paul. Acts 27, let me read it to you. Listen to what Paul says. See if this sounds familiar. And now I exhort you be of good cheer isn't that crazy be of good cheer how in the world can I be of good cheer when I'm in a storm of such magnitude when it looks like utter death when all hope is lost Paul said be of good cheer for thou shalt no man's life among you be lost but just the ship well that's enough if you tell me the ship I'm on is going to be destroyed, sometimes my faith doesn't make it past that. I'm not going to get hurt, but the ship for sure is. That doesn't make me feel any better. But listen to the authority he claimed. He said, For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul. Thou must be brought before Caesar. Again, reminding him, You're going to Rome. And lo, God hath given them all that sail with you. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe, God, that that shall be as he told me. What a testimony. Not only did Paul testify to the point to where he was locked up for testifying, and God said, you're going to testify of me in Rome. He got to testify all the way to Rome. He got to testify to all these people in front of Felix, in front of Festus, in front of Agrippa, to all the people that were on the boat, even down to the captain. And then they were shipwrecked on an island called Malta, and he was able to testify to all the people on the island. God had a plan, but it required Paul going through circumstances. Instead of Paul losing faith or just having initial faith, Paul's faith outlasted the circumstance. Glory to God. That is why Paul could write in 2 Timothy, I fought a good fight. I finished the course. Now listen, I kept the faith. That means that he didn't put his faith away and begin to sink. He didn't become angry. He didn't become fearful. He didn't become grumbling. You won't find it. What did Paul become? He became enduring and faithful. He persevered through the circumstances. 
Paul later wrote to the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians 9, 8, God is able to make all grace abound to you that you always having all sufficiency in all things may abound in every good work. Understand what a big verse this is. He was encouraging them saying, no matter what circumstance you're going through, the grace of God is promised you to give you all sufficiency. Even if you can't figure it out, even if you don't think you can walk above that storm, I will give you sufficiency, not because you deserve it, but my grace will abound. And then he told the church in Philippi, in Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Has God begun a good work in anybody here? I want to tell you something. The work of salvation, if you're saved, God's began a good work in you. If you're saved, God's began a good work in you. And He will carry that work out. This is a promise from God to us. Be confident that I will carry it out until the day of Jesus Christ. Well, I'm going through a circumstance now. That's part of the good work you have to get through. But you can't get through it fearful. You can't get through it angry. And you can't get through it grumbling. How do you get through it? Faithful. You see, you can have faith that will carry God's plan for you out. Your faith will enable you to outlast your circumstance. How many people would like to outlast your circumstance? We come in here all the time and we say, I know God's got something for us. I know he's going to get through it. But then we turn around and that little believing faith that happens either in a service or for an hour or for a day or for a week or for a month, something happens, doesn't it? It doesn't outlast our circumstance. Do you realize that's not a complete faith? It's a believing initial faith. But if your believing initial faith is only going to snatch you from hell and get you into heaven, it's not what God intended for you. He wants a belief that can outlast the circumstance. Why? That is your light, brother and sister. That's your light. When all those around you are going through this, your light, your testimony is that of Paul. Your testimony is to say, be of good cheer. God's told us we can get through this. We might have this for a season, but God's promises say this and say this and say this. Amen? Now, Peter went through it, Paul went through it, and James explains it. James chapter 1. Several verses that are so hard for us to grasp. James chapter 1. When you find your place, say, I have it. My brethren, count it all a joy when you fall into divers temptation. That means various testings or circumstances. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Count it all a joy when you fall or when you face various kinds of trials or circumstances. Count it a joy. Are you kidding me? How many of us have counted it a joy to go through what we're going right now? Oh, me, right? Pastor, I know you say it, but I just, I'm not there. I get it. Our natural person is not there because we see the wind and the waves. Count it a joy. There's a reason you can count it a joy. He said, knowing this, knowing what? That the trying of your faith worketh patience. Now, let me translate this. We always think it's patience. Patience to wait in a line. Patience to wait on a stop sign. Patience to do this. No, this patience he's speaking of here, of here is a persevering faith. Yes, it's a patience on God to do what he's going to do, but it's a persevering faith this patience or perseverance that's spoken here is a faith in God, a belief and trust in God that is more than just momentary faith. 
It's more than just a statement of faith that says, I know that God is going to work out this circumstance and then the next day go right back to worrying and fearing or grumbling. Let me get a witness now. How many people find yourself in the circumstance we're in, all of a sudden, sporadically, you feel good about things, you're charged up, you have this faith that says God's going to get us through here. You raised your hands this morning, but then we leave here and something else that we see on the news or some new thing happens, maybe it's lasted longer or maybe it's went to a new degree or maybe you hear something that you thought you would never hear and then all of a sudden that faith that you knew God was going to work it out where did it go? Anybody? Thank you for being honest. It helps the ones around you that aren't. Where does it go? You see, that faith wasn't a faith that could outlast the circumstance. And James says, you're going through the circumstance, the trying, the trying of your faith works persevering faith. The circumstances working, persevering faith. What is a persevering faith? It's a faith that we carry around longer than just the church service or a day or two. It's a perpetual faith that can, we can keep using day after day no matter how long the circumstance lasts. It's a belief in God's power and control to handle the circumstance no matter how long the circumstance lasts and no matter how it may seem that it's getting worse. How many people need to hear this word today? It's a persevering faith. It's a perfect faith. You say perfect, he means complete. Why is this key? It's key because we have a faith, but our faith is not getting to the complete stage. But there's a word in here that jumped out to me that we see in verse 4 because this is our command he already said the trying of your faith worketh patience he already said knowing this but look at verse 4 verse 4 says but let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire wanting nothing our faith needs to be a persevering faith not lacking anything when the circumstance either lasts too long or gets worse. But something key here, in the King James, you have this word let. I know some other versions you may be reading don't have it, but I want you to look at the word let because it's important. He says, let, let patience have her perfect work. Let your persevering faith have her perfect work. This is big. Why is it big? To let is to allow. Say it with me. To let is to what? So we're told to allow our persevering faith to have its perfect work. Allow it. Allowing it. For us to allow means that we're in control. That's big. He puts it back on us. The faith is there, but we have to allow it. Did Paul allow it? Yes. Did Peter allow it? No. Peter's faith didn't outlast the circumstance. Paul's faith outlasts the circumstance. It's put on us as believers to allow our persevering faith. You see, this is the problem that most of us have. We don't allow our faith to finish the situation or circumstance that we're in. If our faith doesn't outlast the circumstance, our faith doesn't have its perfect work. Can I define perfect work? Complete effectiveness. God gives you a faith that can accomplish complete effectiveness. But if you don't have a persevering faith, if you just have the faith that gets you out of the boat, then you won't see the complete effectiveness. And sadly... There's a lot of Christians that are not experiencing the complete effectiveness of their faith. And because of that, we're not shining the light the way that we need to. We have a faith in God's provision so many times for a moment or a day or a week. But then we begin to dwell on our reasoning of how bad something seems or how much worse our circumstance might get unless certain things happened. And at that point... We don't let or allow our faith to become persevering faith. We don't allow our faith 
to be based on the trust that God will see us through it. It's like at some point we begin to doubt that God will carry us through our circumstance because our circumstance has lasted longer than we wanted it to. We had that initial faith and we heard that report and somebody said, hey, hey, God's going to take care of it. And I heard a lot of us saying that. And somewhere along the trail it's lasted a little bit longer. Are we still saying that? It's like we get tired of waiting on God to do what we think he should do. Paul made a point in 1 Corinthians 10. I didn't give you this scripture, but I just want to reference it. If you were to read 1 Corinthians 10, Paul was using the disobedience of the children of Israel when he was freeing them from Pharaoh and Egypt. He used the example to display why God was upset at them. They were being delivered from bondage in Egypt. They were being brought into the promised land. God told them, I'm going to bring you into this land. Here's a promise. That's why it's called the promised land. How many people knew that they became idolatrous? How many people knew they got tired of waiting? How many people knew that they began to grumble? And God was so displeased with them. When you get to verses 10 of 1 Corinthians 10, you'll see that Paul made reference Paul was saying they began to murmur. This murmur, murmur you. He said, neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed by the destroyer. This murmuring is a grumbling, not a pleasant grumbling, usually a grumbling that's done in little groups. And then the little groups become bigger groups. And then the bigger groups become bigger groups. And before long, the murmuring takes over. The grumbling takes over. The dissatisfaction, the discontentment. They begin to murmur. Why was God unhappy? Because he had delivered them from bondage. That's what he had done for them. He was presently feeding them, taking care of them, giving them everything they need. And future, he was going to promise to give them everything they could possibly need in their own land. Past, present, future. Yet they were grumbling. Why? Because the faith that they exemplified in God when he would bring them through something, go back and read the Old Testament and you'll be able to see. When he brought them through something, boy, they praised God, didn't they? They had that initial faith. There is only one God. And then before long, what happened? Paul said, I'm using this for an example. And then he goes on to say, mark my word. This is what Paul says. For there is no temptation taking you, no testing taking you, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, but such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tested or tempted above that which you're able to bear, but will also with that temptation make you a way to escape. Glory to God. You know what that means? That means everybody's going to have circumstances. Everybody's going to have testing. This is the proving of your faith. And God says, there's no situation. There's no wave too big. There's no storm too big that can stop me from carrying out my perfect plan for you. Glory to God. Do I have a reason to fear? It makes no difference if the ship is falling apart underneath me. The Bible is telling me if my faith that outlasts the circumstance, my persevering faith is here, glory to God. If it's here, then I have no reason to fear. I have no reason to be angry. I have no reason to grumble. Neither grumble ye. And that's what's happened. Even us that are of the same mind about something, we have our little group that we get and it makes us feel good to say, did you hear this? Did you hear that? What if they do this? What if they do that? Listen, I'm just in the story. I didn't write it. I know who wrote it. Paul said, I'm just in the story, and the story says I'm getting to Rome. Well, my story says every night that I'm here on this earth, I have a father I can go to, and he loves on me, and he provides for me, and he comes to me, and he invites me to come to him. And if my life here is over, then he says, hey, you're coming to me. I prepared a place for you, and if I prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. If I believe that, then my persevering faith, my faith that outlasts the circumstance, can face any circumstance. What good is my faith if it gets me out of the boat and then I begin to sink? 
I need a faith that outlasts the circumstance. And Paul said, you can have one. If God started this good work in you, be sure he will carry it out. There won't be a circumstance that's beyond my control. I see those things on TV that said, circumstances beyond our control. My heavenly father doesn't have a circumstance beyond his control. Amen. Glory to him. The Bible tells us that Jesus said in John 16 he said, in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Can you hear? Be of good cheer. Have you, how many times have you heard it? I have overcome the world. Listen, when I signed up to go with him, I signed up to go with him. Did you? He overcame the world and he promised me I would overcome the world. Why in the world can I not have a faith in the middle of my circumstances that lets me be able to go there? like Paul went there, right? The Bible says in Romans chapter 8 that God made a partnership with us. We became his child and he became our father. We call it a covenant. And he said, I didn't give you the spirit of bondage again to fear, but I gave you the spirit of adoption whereby you cry, Abba, Father. He went on to say later on, in this world you will groan. And we've been groaning. And there are things that are going to make us groan. In this world, in this life, you will, you will groan. He said, so I'm going to give you some help in the form of the Holy Spirit. When you're groaning, you can come to me and the Holy Spirit will utter things to me that you can't even say. Sometimes you just cry out to me. He makes every way in the world for us to have faith that outlasts our circumstance. And he said, if you forget that, then no that all these things that are happening work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. I'm here to tell you today, if you have a believing faith and you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, glory to God. Amen. Glory to God. But if your faith is not outlasting your circumstance, you're missing out on the beauty of this circumstance. You say, what's the beauty and what's going on? What's the beauty in financial hardship? What's the beauty in physical hardship? What's the beauty in this? What's the beauty? God's given you an opportunity to walk on water for those around you. He's given you an opportunity to save everybody on the ship that you're put on. Glory to God. Why can't we start seeing it that way and have a persevering faith? That's a complete faith. What do I need to fear? My mind tells me to fear. But my faith has got to be bigger than my sight. Your faith has got to be bigger than your sight. When's it going to get better, Pastor Mike? I don't know, but it is. I don't know how long the circumstance lasts. I just know that the circumstance is going to end with me and you standing beside of Jesus. Is that any solace? The circumstance is going to end this evening if he don't come back with me on my face talking to him. The circumstance is going to begin in the morning the same way with me on my face talking to him. And why would he talk to me? Why would he talk to you? But he does take solace in it. If you've never accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you need to have an initial believing faith. Without that believing faith, I'm going to tell you what you need to do. Without that faith, if you're going to believe in yourself, then no matter what circumstance, you need to mourn, you need to cry, you need to fear, and you need to grumble. But that's all you can do. But God gives you a way to believe in Him past and through your circumstance. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. You might go through it, but you won't go through it alone. Glory to God. What a promise. If you've never accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, when this service, when we give this invitation, don't wait. 
I'm going to be standing right here. I want to pray with you. You can accept the Lord Jesus Christ. I've got a mask in my coat I'll wear. We'll go through. You'll, I'll explain the gospel to you. You can pray and right now leave here. It don't matter who's watching you, knowing you've accepted his promise. But if you've done that and you find that I'm confident in my faith, but my faith doesn't seem to outlast my circumstance, here's the time for you to confess that to God and ask God to strengthen you. Here's the time for you to be able to say, God, help me with this. I know. I know you've got me in a place to where ship around me. These people need to see my faith that outlasts the circumstance. Every father, every mother, every parent, every child, every brother, every sister, every co-worker, everybody, every people group you're in. Everybody's faith isn't strong at one time. They need to see yours. What kind? That persevering faith, the faith that outlasts the circumstance. I don't know how long the circumstance will last, but I know that we'll get through it. Father God, I love you. I praise you and I thank you for this day and I praise you for your word. I pray God as your word is spoken today that you would use it, Lord, to minister to us. If there's somebody here that's never accepted your son Jesus as Savior, I pray, God, today they would see their need, Lord, to call out and have that believing faith. They would step out of the boat of life, Lord, and believe that you're the one and only true living God. Believe that Jesus is their only way to come to you. I pray, God, for them to be saved today. And I pray, Lord, for Christians all over this place today. We've heard your word. We've seen, God, a faith that outlasts circumstances, Lord, but we're lacking in a lot of times. We get to looking at everything around us, Lord. I pray today, show us who we are. And Lord, listen to the prayers. Listen to the prayers of your children as we cry out to you, Lord. Immediately reach out and grab our hand, Lord. I pray, God, today for restoration and rededication of the lives of your children here. Use your message today to do it.